Five. All right. Thank you. Welcome to House Transportation, Highways, and Military Affairs. Uh, Diana, if I can have you call roll, please. Representative Berger. Here. Representative Nemec. Here. Representative Obermuller. Uh, he'll be here. Keep it open. Representative O'Hearn. Here. Representative Pendergraf. Here. Representative Smith. Here. Representative Stivar. Present. Representative Wiley. Here. Chairman Brown. Here. All right, we got nine present. Thank you all for being here. We're going to get started. We've got three bills, one of them being a little bit more intricate than the rest. So we're going to start off with a fairly easy bill. We're going to start off with House Bill 41. Um, and I will ask uh, YDOT to walk us through the bill here as it stands and the discussion that occurred during during the interim. And it looks like we've got Mr. Rossetti. And we've also got the county treasurer. So, all right. The floor is yours, gentlemen. Please introduce yourself and uh, title for the record, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Taylor Rossetti, uh, YDOT Support Services Administrator. <clears throat> to my right, I've got Joel Shell, the Converse County Treasurer. House Bill 41 is really lightweight permanent trailer registrations. Uh, through the interim, the bill came to us as basically all trailer for permanent registrations. And I think as we worked through it uh, with the committee as well as the treasurers, we really decided to cut out a slice of this pie and really go after those light trailers. These are those trailers that are a thousand pounds or less. Uh, think about something you might haul your four wheeler around on or just a small utility type of trailer. Um, the, these would have a uh, permanent register of the ability to have a permanent registration after they hit six years of age. Uh, there's a, a fee and a calculation that's based in the bill. Um, and I think we focused on this, I think basically due to the uh, potential that there is some administrative burden for the amount of fee that you actually collect on these trailers. This actually might ease some work at the, the counter for the counties. I'll let them speak to that. But it also does allow um, some folks that hold on to trailers for a long period of time, just, just ease of administration and they don't have to worry about going back to the county. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I certainly could walk you through the bill. And then I do believe on the back end of this, we've kind of got a joint amendment. It's very small that we may propose. Committee members, any questions up front? No, okay. Mr. Rosetti, if you'll walk us through the bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there on page one, you really just get into the, the purpose and, and in section one, it, it takes you into 312206, which is where we create the new subsections that would allow for this permanent registration. As we move over then into page two, uh, at the top there, we get into 312206, which is the requirement for annual renewal for other registrations. And this is where we start creating uh, the exceptions to allow for a permanent registration. You see there on lines 12 and 13, we're adding um, some additional subsections that will illustrate that for you. Those are subsections N through Q. Then on line 17, uh, we do get into that first new subsection. And this is where we start narrowing that down to the uh, defined trailers. So this is, this is basically N on line 17 through 20. This is getting us into um, where we would go back to and look for the definition of trailer. Uh, further then, it goes down on lines uh, 22. It gets into the specific types of trailers, and on lines 22 and 23 there on page 2, it narrows us down to the light trailers, which are those ones that are under 1,000 pounds. So that's what that reference to 313101A, Romanet 2E, Romanet I. That's the 1,000 pound trailers. Then you get into the other conditions of what would allow this to be eligible. This gets you to trailers that are not less than six years old. Uh, if you guys are aware or, pay or have seen it, that is the age at which a vehicle in the state of Wyoming basically stops depreciating. That's when the fees on the county side basically bottom out. So that means it's gone through the entire depreciation schedule that year six then is the target year for this. And then it has to be subject to the fees under 312201, which is just the requirement to register trailers. So that's that's basically what's in there. Moving further then on page three, uh, lines uh, seven through 16, this starts talking about the specified fees that would be required if you were to use this process. Moving into lines 18 through 20, 
that starts getting into what those fees would be. It would take a $50 basically administration fee up front. And then on lines 22 and 23, it starts getting into five times the applicable fees under Wyoming statute 313101A. Our proposed amendment would be to strike and B. Uh, we can speak that at the end here, Mr. Chairman. Then moving on through to page four, it goes on further and basically says that any donation which is allowed, and this is typically your search and rescue, your organ donation, wildlife um, fees, the client does not have to make that a five times donation. So if they want to donate ten dollars, they can only do they only can do donate ten dollars. They wouldn't have to donate fifty. So that's what that language is in there for, just to make it clear that just because they're doing five times the registration doesn't mean they have to do five times the donation. That's what the purpose of that was. And then P goes into that the uh, person would actually have the permanent license plate displayed in accordance to this section. And then Q, you start getting into the transfer provisions, which there was an awful lot of discussion in the um, interim as about how that would be Currently, and, and Mr. Shell can certainly go into some great detail if you guys would like, you can get credit if you transfer plates to like vehicles. And there's a formula that they use in order to determine what those credits would be. This is permanent. So the issue was, is how would you determine what the prorated fee would be? So there was some discussion along that line. So that, that gets into what those, those conditions would be. Moving then on to page four. Uh, the addition there on line two is just because we've added to that additional subsection E below, so that just conforms the statute. And then if you move on to um, line 16 through 23, this talks about what that process for transferring would be. So if you transfer that to yourself within 60 days, you could just straight transfer it if the new vehicle or the new trailer you purchased was eligible for a permanent registration. If it's outside that 60 day window, you'd have to start back over, pay the administrative fee and five times the fee again. So that was the compromise I think we worked through in the interim to handle the transfer. Moving then on through to page six, it completes that language just so that it's clear as to what those um, transfers might look like under those conditions. And then moving into um, the end there on lines 14 and 15, it just simply talks about um, the vehicles that are exempt from the payment of additional fees. And what that would mean is, is that after you've went through this process, that trailer is permanently registered, you don't have to pay an additional registration fee. Um, Mr. Chairman, with that, that's the bill. Committee, any questions on the bill for Mr. Rossetti at this point? All right, Mr. Shell, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Joel Shell, the Congress County Treasurer. I'm here today representing the County Treasurer's Association. Uh, who is very much in favor of this bill. So I appreciate your time in uh, picking it up. Um, this is one of those opportunities where you can have a piece of legislation that will both save the government money and provide a benefit to your constituents. So we look at it like a unicorn bill, right? I see them very often. Uh, in Converse County, for example, last year we registered about 2,000 of these lightweight trailers. These are the ones they generally cost about $10 is the lowest you can pay with the, with the little plate on them. 89% um, of those were fully depreciated, so those would meet the criteria of this bill. And the average fee for those 89% we registered was about $11.66. So if you looked at that, uh, the people who were getting these $10 plates is what, what most of them are. Uh, would cost them $100 to get this, this plate, which you know the break-even point for that would be 10 years. Uh, and we're trying to balance that incentive to have people come in and do it uh, versus a recognition that we do still receive some revenue from those. So I think the committee in the interim, we were able to work the bill uh, and, and this is the price point they arrived at and we think is fair. Um, and that's the longest one. If you have a more expensive trailer, for example, if you had a, a trailer you know, with a factory cost of 5,000, you would pay a little under $100 when it was brand new. It would depreciate down to maybe 35 or right around $32. And so then your break even point would be after six or seven years with the permanent play for what you paid versus what the annualized cost would be. So we think it's a good bill. Uh, that, that benefits both the uh, constituents and the government. For us, right now, we collect them on that $10 fee. The county gets $5 of it, but we distribute it like other taxes, so we end up with about a dollar, and it would cost us much more than a dollar to send reminder cards and issue plates and, and get these people in the door to do it. So I think it's a great benefit, and uh, I would stand for any of the questions you have or discussion of the, the amendment. Great. Any questions for Mr. Shell? 
I do have one. So you said that the average in, in Converse County, on my suspicion, mm -hmm. is it's probably pretty average across the state at $11.66. Is that right? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. I would think ours is a pretty representative sample of what you're going to see statewide. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. We have anybody else that would like to testify on this bill? Seeing nobody rushing to the mic, we'll give it one more chance. All right, public testimony is closed. Nobody online, correct? Okay. All right, committee, what is your pleasure? Move the bill. Moved by O'Hearn. Second. Second by Berger. Um, Taylor, I apologize. Yeah, yeah, if I can steal you one really quick, I, I did mean to ask you that. I want to make sure that I have your proposed amendment correct. Um, committee, we'll, we'll walk through the bill very quickly here. We'll get to page three where I believe that was at. Um, any amendments on page one? Moving over to page two. Page three, I believe, is where we had the uh, amendment. And let me make sure I understand that. That would be page three, line 23, striking and B. Is that correct? Correct, Mr. Chairman. OK. So I have that as a proposed amendment. Would somebody like to move that? I'd like exactly what is uh, removing B going to do? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> so the fees underneath B are generally not applicable to these types of vehicles. The, the fees that we were talking about through the interim, and we believe that what the intent of the bill was, is covered in 313101A. And those are really the normal county registration schedule as what the and the state fee. What's in B are just different exceptions and things to the rule that we don't believe were representative or included in the original discussions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Representative Obermuller. Uh, thank you. So just on that point, what are we striking? What through what lines are we striking the language? That's it. Just and B. And B. Yep, that's it. Oh, and then the plus is something else. Correct. Thank you. So it's been moved. Uh, need a second? Anybody? Second. Second. Okay. Discussion on the amendment. All right. Question being called. Waiting for somebody. Question. Okay. There we go. Question being called on the amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no? No. Amendment passes. Any other amendments? Let's move down to page four. Page five, page six. All right. Question. Question being called. Diana, would you please call roll? This is on House Bill 41 as amended. Representative Berger? Aye. Representative Nemec? Aye. Representative Obermuller? Aye. Representative O'Hearn? Aye. Representative Pendergraft? Aye. Representative Smith? Aye. Representative Stivar? Aye. Representative Wiley? Aye. Chairman Brown? Aye. That's nine ayes. Do pass with amendment. Thank you, Diana. Uh, do we have anybody who would be interested in carrying this out on the floor? <coughs> Representative Nemec? Okay. All right. So Representative Nemec will carry House Bill 41 out on the floor. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be probably the little bit more of the discussion. Uh, we probably have a little bit of education that's going to come on this particular bill. So if you do have questions as we're going through this in the discussion, um, please make sure you just alert me. Um, don't wait till the end. We want to make sure that we get all these questions answered as we come forward. So Director Reiner, anybody you have bring forward. Uh, we're going to move into House Bill 44. This is Road and Bridge Construction Alternative Contracting. Director Reiner, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, uh, Luke Reiner, Director of YDOT. I'll just give a couple uh, introductory comments on House Bill 44. And then really turn turn the floor over uh, to Mr. Fulton to sort of explain some of the concepts behind it, and then walk through the bill if you so if you so desire. But but really, as as we look at this business of doing construction projects around the state, which certainly is our business, um, we are today held to one way 
of really bidding the contract and building it and and this design bid build and as we look at other options that are available and as we look at other options that are currently authorized in statute for vertical construction and as we look at projects that we see coming in the future we think we need some more tools in our toolbox and so what this bill does in the end is authorize the our department the Department of Transportation, the same options currently authorized to the State Building Commission in terms of vertical. All right, that's, that's the oversight. Now there's some details involved, but in the end, uh, what the bill does, it allows us to use options currently available to others in the state on the vertical side and ask that we be allowed to use those. Um, and, and I view it as a director as uh, the ability for us to apply the right tool uh, to the right project. Uh, it's just like having multiple hammers, uh, you know, in, in your tool pouch. And, and so that, that's, my, that's, that's my view of it uh, from my level. And with that, Mr. Chairman, unless you have questions from me, I'll pass, it, pass the floor to Mr. Fulton. Any questions? I do have one, Director. Um, just to make sure that this is one of the things that's come out on, on a few of the other bills already is um, just making sure that when we're talking with YDOT, we have not only the legislative body, but we also have the commission. And can you maybe just touch base briefly on what the commission's role would be with this and making sure that they still have oversight of these um, these projects, even though we have the design bid build, we would move away from um, particularly that's only being the section, uh, but what the commission's role would be still to make sure that we have checks. You, you bet, Mr. Chairman. Uh, really, uh, the role of the commission is, is certainly to approve uh, the contracts that are let to Wyoming contractors with the, the fiscal resources that belong to the Department of Transportation. In this case, then I would see no change in the role of the commission. They would, based on the type of bidding that was used, they would still approve it and thus the oversight of, you know, a, a, a seven, you know, individual board appointed by the governor that, that really plays an important part in our state. Uh, which is to ensure an outside body uh, that makes sure that that contracts uh, are given with impartiality and in accordance with the law. So I, I would see no change there. Perfect. Thank you. Mr. Fulton. Oh, uh, Representative Steibar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Reiner, on a design build, uh, I've worked with three design builds before. So you're going to... Commission's going to monitor that design build is in my history and what I do is a design build keeps bringing the cost of the project higher and higher and higher. Where if you design it, uh, design build, a design build, you know, your, your costs are set. But a design build, you know, design build, you know, the, the, extra, the constant changes in things. <laughs> keeps bringing that cost of that project up. So is how, how are you guys working with that? Yeah, Mr. Director. Chairman and, and Representative Stivar, um, so we're one of very few states that doesn't allow design build today. Um, as we've talked to others, that's not an issue of increasing price. What I might, what I might request is that we kick yeah. that to Mr. Fulton. That's certainly part of his presentation. Maybe we let him walk through his presentation and that, that's probably applicable spot to, to maybe revisit that and you can address that as you go through. Perfect. Mr. Fulton, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Keith Fulton, Assistant Chief Engineer for Engineering and Planning for the Wyoming Department of Transportation. So I'm gonna go through this presentation. I think a copy was provided, thank you. All right. So as the director mentioned, the, uh, the issue is that the commission, Transportation Commission, YDOT is only authorized to award projects to the lowest responsible bidder for horizontal or highway construction. And that is also called the Design Bid Build or DBB. Our federal partner, FHWA, we work with, get most of our funding for construction and design. They're encouraging states to look at alternate uh, contracting methods to help expedite delivery, streamline costs, hopefully improve outcomes, which a lot of times can be construction time. Using these alternating country, uh, contract, contracting methods uh, for projects with unique design and, and construction requirements would hopefully help us to be a little more efficient and save on uh, with efficiencies and, and cost savings. 
and then allowing, as the director said, allowing the commission to use other methods to align it with the building construction that's being done now. So on the next page, the current contracting method or design bid build, and that's what we do, and that's three distinct phases. So why dot, or if we have a consultant would just completely uh, completed design. So we do all the environmental work, everything through. Once that's fully completed, then we take the project to bid. So we'd advertise for bid, bring those bids open and read them publicly, bring them to our commission. Commission would approve our award, and then we go to construction. So on the next page are just some of the different alternate contracting methods. The first one is construction management, general contractor, sometimes CMGC, or construction manager at risk. This is a two-phase one. And this is where you hire the contractor up front. And so the contractor comes in and helps you with the design. So they're standing there and they're working with our designers, our consultant hand in hand, and they're designing the project around their means and methods. And so they're involved, so they're, they're understanding the risk of the project. They understand all the, the foundations and all that different information they need to build the project. And that's incorporated in the design. Once the design then, then you go to this contractor and say, give me a guaranteed maximum price of this project. And you negotiate that price out. Once that's agreed upon, then they can start construction and then they're assuming all risk after that for any cost overruns or anything else. Uh, if we can agree to a guaranteed maximum price, then we could go back to our old method and we'd take it out and open up for bids and do a low bid process. The next one is design build. And this is really when you have one phase and this is where the contractor and a designer is hired. So many times you'll have a contractor they'll work with, uh, they'll team up with a design firm or some of the larger firms will have in-house, but they're doing all the design and the contracting at the same time. So up front, YDOT would do a selection process or any state would do a selection process and that could be based on a scope. It sets a scope, it sets the performance measures and a lot of times these will have a fixed price uh, as, you can, as you do the negotiation. But then at that time, you, once they're selected, then they're in charge of everything. They do all the complete design all, and, and they can do the construction. And many times this can save time because they can start constructing before the design is completed. So many times, uh, you know, if you have a big bridge project, once the foundation is designed, they can start working on the foundation while the rest of the bridge is still being designed. So it's, supposed, it's helped to speed up. It allows them to be their own innovation and it should bring uh, less claims in litigation because they're handling everything within that. So on the next page is a couple more. One is multi-prime. Uh, this is one that YDOT probably wouldn't use, but this is where if you have one project, so we have a road project and a bridge project, and we prime one for each. So we have a prime contractor for the pavement side and a prime contractor for the bridge, and you've got really two contractors working in the same area. Nobody has true oversight. So that's one that we're, um, we're not really looking at. And the last one is indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, or IDIQ. And this is where you would go to a contractor to either provide services and or materials over a fixed time, but they don't have a, a defined quantity. So we would come in and say, all right, give us a unit cost for these items. And then as we need to use them, we would contact them and say, okay, now we need X feet of this that you have a, a unit price for, you provide it. They don't know how, many, how much quantity total they'll have or how many times they're going to use it. But it's, and that's the indefinite part of it, so. Uh, again, this is something that we're interested in, but not included in the bill this time, something we'd like to look at in the future. So uh, to finish up, then really our recommendation is to allow YDOT that uh, contracting methods to help us um, have that extra tool in the toolbox, as, uh, as the director mentioned. We will continue to use our low bid, our design bid build. The majority, a vast majority of our projects will continue with that low bid, but this gives us a tool for these specialized projects that when, when they come up that we can look at alternate methods to hopefully be a little bit more efficient, hopefully save some costs and time. And so the recommendation is to amend our statute 24-2-108 to allow that alternate uh, delivery method. With that, I would take any questions, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add a couple things. So that was, a, that was an excellent walkthrough there. One of the questions you probably ask is, well, what type of projects would you might consider this? We have a big one we'd like to do, the I-25, I-80 interchange here in Cheyenne. It's built in the 1960s and trucks keep falling over on it and it's old design and it'd be really helpful to get that, that fixed. We think that's too big for design bid build, all right? And, and that's, that's the, thus the design build type concept would, would be really helpful in that project. And as you start looking to do some of these bigger projects, it just, that's, that's where we sort of need the tool 
the other thing I would would share with you and is that um, we have partners in this business and and before we ever brought this forward and I believe she's here today I know she's here today certainly worked with the AGC and, and Ms. Kate Ligursky and, and, and her team to saying hey listen is this something that that you would support and is this something you you know you see is needed and certainly it was a thumbs up from them uh, as you know as we go forward together uh, in this space uh, with that just add those two comments and, and back to Mr. Fortman questions all right uh, representative Wiley <clears throat> yeah Mr. Director um, I have I have two questions for you folks one is is how, how are we going to ensure that we can that we continue to do our competitive bid process for fairness there and then two, I have a concern, is, is this gonna create um, something that goes beyond regional contractors to where you know, contractors within the state aren't gonna have a chance to, to be a part of this work and it'll just be a big regional player come in to, to do the project? Director or Mr. Fulton? Part of the selection process, you know, you'd, you'll have to come up with a, really an RFP type thing where there's qualification base and that. So that would still require us to consider uh, several different contractors. So they would all have to apply for this. Um, and so there would still be part of that uh, as in the selection process. Follow up. Follow up. Thank you. So, so how would this RFP process uh, t take place? Like who would you have for that panel for the RFP? Mr. Fulton. Mr. Chairman, Representative. Um, as we haven't done this yet, it's, it's a new process as, for us, but you know, we would assume we would have probably, um, you know, of course, members from YDOT, maybe a commissioner um, a, a right now is who we typically have on that panel, I would think. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, if, I could just, if I could just add to that, you know, there is, um, it's our responsibility to ensure that we have fair and equitable and consistent competition in the state, not interested in doing anything else. And, and what we know is, like Mr. Fulton says, we haven't done it before, but what we know is there's established best practices in the industry to get us there. And, and you know, our assurances to you is we will, the oversight is our commission and this body. And, and so I'm really comfortable as a director embarking on this, knowing that uh, all eyes will be on us in terms of, hey, are you doing this right? And knowing that our commitment to our partners in the contracting industry and to, you know, the constituents, your constituents across the state is that we'll do it right. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Oh, Chairman, um, Mr. I was gonna, he had a second part of that I was trying to follow. Oh, absolutely. On, on the Please. regional part. Um, and so, yeah, depending on the size of the project, a project like the IADI interchange, you know, that's that's a four hundred million dollar plus project, and so there could be concerns about local contractors being able to bond and, and provide that. But for us, I think we're trying to look at we would want to start small and make sure we have projects that our contractors can be can um, qualify for, because we want them to be part of the process of also developing the specs, but make sure they can do it, and then it helps us both learn from that. Follow up. Mr. Riley? Yeah, yeah, my concern there was, is, you know, there, there's still room there for subcontracting and stuff and, and just some kind of mechanism that would be attractive for the general to, to still allow, you know, Wyoming jobs, people people work, working within the state to, to have a, a shot at those projects too. Not, not that they can take the entire project, but um, I'm well assured that there's, there's plenty of people and, you know, skill within the state that they can do a lot of that work. Yeah. Thank you. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. <laughs> Make sure we have questions at this point. We'll, we'll come back. That's okay. We'll have a little bit of latitude. Uh, Representative Pendergraft. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure whether to direct this to the director or the chief engineer. Um, I see on page three of the handout under design build, it says a DB team, design build team. Could you describe for me the members of that team, what that team would consist of? Thank you. Either one, uh, Chairman or Mr. Fulton, or I'm sorry, Director or Mr. Fulton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, our Representative, the, the design build team would be the uh, team that we contract. So that would be the team of the consultant and the contractor that does that. And with, um, you know, YDOT would be involved in, 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 of course, reviews and being out there at the construction site. But in this case, that's the, the team that we've hired to do all the design and contracting. 
follow up? Just a little bit deeper on your side. I understand because I understand that I'm a contractor, have been for many years. So I understand what I'm going to bring to the table. Who am I going to sit down with? Is this a team of engineers? Does it include whom? Mr. Fulton. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Representative. Uh, yeah, on the YDOT side, we would have people that would be, we want to have expertise in the type of project. So if it's a bridge project, we would have our bridge engineers sit down and, and work along with this, along with our design people, environmental. We would just grab our, our typical team that would be involved in design, they would be involved here to, to have that oversight. Any further questions? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did you want, Mr. Chairman, would you like me to walk through the bill? Um, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Um, I, I feel like the bill is fairly self-explanatory. You guys have done a good job, but just for reference sake and to make sure that we understand exactly what's going on, I appreciate that. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, page one, again, the purpose is just to uh, allow alternate contracting methods to the uh, Department of Transportation and our Transportation Commission. Uh, and, and all this is within section uh, 242108, road and bridge construction. Page two, lines nine and 10, that's where we're adding the new section that mentions the type of deliveries that we can do. Uh, then falling down on page three, again, we're adding the new section, subsection C, and this is the portion of an emergency contract. So if we have an emergency and we um, have this tool on our tool belt, maybe there's a time that we could use this to help do that. So it allows the commission to do it for normal highway projects and also with an emergency project. Mr. Fulton, on that, um, I'm just thinking the, the Lusk Bridge was a, a very serious situation in which this probably could have come into play. Is that right? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Turning on page four, uh, section B on line seven and eight. Uh, this section is about how we procure professional services consultants. And so in the case of a design build, we're not going to procure them the same way that the statute would uh, require us to because you're doing it as now as a team uh, and it could be part of a fixed price type contract. So it just that gives us an exception there. Then section C is the meat of the bill. This is the new project, uh, the new part. So as authorized by, uh, I'm on line 10, 166702, uh, which just allows uh, alternate, del uh, alternate delivery methods. Um, and then notwithstanding 166706, pardon me, the commission may use alternate designs of the notwithstanding is, is there's a section in that that says you can't use it for federal funds. And so that's just giving that exception because we do most of our projects with federal yeah. funds. Um, and then, uh, the, then following the 166701 is the definitions of the alternate methods, which are the cons uh, construction manager at risk and, and design build are the two that's allowable. And then finally, subsections A and B do not apply. And that's just saying that, you know, if you're going to use low bid, you don't have to go back and you're not, I mean, if you're using an alternate delivery method, excuse me, you don't have to use low bid. Um, Mr. Fulton, just to make sure I understand the 166702, that's current statute for um, state construction. Is that correct? That is correct. And so we're just referencing their current authority to, to utilize these services as opposed to rewriting this inside of YDOT. That is correct. Okay. Yeah, I think Mr. Mr. Chairman, I think just to expand on that, 166702 is, is vertical construction authorization to do um, alternate design. 166706 is the whole federal funds issue. 16, 16-6-701 is where the actual definitions of the currently allowable alternate delivery methods are in the vertical construction section. Okay. Thank you. Director? All right. And based on that, uh, looks like it just goes into here. Looks like we do make this effective immediately. Uh, to assist you guys, um, just out of curiosity, when I joined this committee seven years ago now, uh, the discussion of the IADI 25 was, it was just starting, and at that time, the price tag was around 275 million. And I just heard a discussion of upwards of 400 million. What is the potential status of that? I know at one point uh, with the former director, we were looking at, um, there was gonna be some congressional authorization for some money on that. Um, what are we looking at for something like that right now? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, so we uh, did some preliminary design work uh, with a, a consultant, and then now we're, um, and that's where we stopped. 
and we've uh, applied for several grants to help us complete the design and we have not received those at that time. So we're continuing to look for those type of opportunities. Um, and the $400 million that I mentioned, that's a couple years old estimate. And now with the prices we're seeing lately, it could be much higher. Okay. Thank you. Committee, any further questions for the director, or Mr. Fulton? All right, thank you so much. We'll open this up for any other um, public entities. I don't see anybody else. Katie, you're, you're probably good to go ahead and start coming this way. I don't see anybody else. But... All right, and we'll open this up for public comment. Ms. Ligurski, if you please introduce yourself, Mr. Madsen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Katie Ligurski with Associated General Contractors, and I brought with me well, the resident expert, Mark Madsen with WHS. He told me he was just coming with me to look pretty, but he can actually answer a lot of the technical questions today. As Director Reiner with YDOT pointed out, we are very supportive of allowing YDOT to use alternative delivery methods within the construction. I would like to just um, answer a question that Representative Wiley had, because we did have a lot of the same concerns that he brought up about opening this up and what it would do to Wyoming contractors who have not used alternative delivery methods within the state of Wyoming um, before. We do have a number of contractors who have used alternative delivery methods um, with vertical construction, not necessarily with horizontal construction. We do have a good working relationship with YDOT. They have assured us that when the time has come or if this measure does pass, that we will sit down with them, work on the specifications, work with them so that the industry is very comfortable with the language so we can assure that our members can compete for some of the projects. Obviously, we have watched what has happened in other states. Nebraska just recently went into the endeavor of adding alternative delivery methods into their DOT specifications. And Mr. Madsen can point out some of that information. We have seen how the other states have incorporated that. Um, so we can follow what other states have done to ensure that the local contractors can compete. Um, I also want to note that usually over 70% of in-state contractors do perform YDOT projects. So we do have some contractors that do do work in the state of Wyoming from outside of Wyoming. Katie, Excuse me, Mr. Chair. That's okay. Representative Berger. Mr. Chairman, just a clarification. You said 70% or 78%? No, sorry, I didn't hear that. Ms. Ligurski. Mr. Chairman, usually it's, it's more than 70% of in-state contractors perform the majority of the work in the state of Wyoming on behalf of YDOT. Thank you. So we are very supportive of, of alternative delivery methods. We do understand that the majority of the projects will be designed, bid, build, we'll continue to do that. But there may be in the future, certain projects will may make sense to go down this route. Um, and if the time does come, we would like to be ready for those projects to be able to go and move forward. So we are supportive with that. And with that, I would stand for any questions. And if you did have any technical questions, Mr. Matson would be more than happy to answer those. Thank you, Ms. Ligurski. Any questions for Ms. Ligurski? Or for that matter, Mr. Matson? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Representative Berger. So this, this question is directed to you, sir. Um, do you also see this as another tool for uh, YDOT and the director and his team. Mr. Batson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the committee, absolutely. Uh, my experience was with the, the meetings with Nebraska as they set it up as, as AGC members in Nebraska. I was with Simon at the time. So I witnessed all of us getting together to write this. You know, it wasn't unilateral. It wasn't just the um, Department of Roads. Um, in Nebraska. And secondly, I was on the team for I-25 Johnstown to Fort Collins with Simon. And, you know, I've been on a team member as a local contractor, and I can tell you we're very comfortable with it. Um, it was pretty much what we did anyway. You know, we, we talked specs and what we could do and how, how much faster and better we could do it if they'd allow it. So um, as far as I can see, there was a, it, it's a great tool to have, especially when you're looking at some of the projects that could be coming. Any further questions from the committee? Uh, Mark, uh, Mr. Madsen, sorry. Uh, out of your expertise, what have you seen as a cost savings um, on opening this up? What are the, 
what are the projected potential savings that you see on something of 400 plus million dollars? Um, you know, is this something that we're saving 100 million dollars on, you know, not staggering it out over the course of X amount of years? Is it time savings? Is it cost savings? What are we seeing with this? Mr. Chairman, great question. Um, so it's difficult because it would be very project specific. The couple that I've witnessed that were um, that would be of great interest were, as you mentioned, the Lust Bridge. I watched a design build presentation by Kiwit, and it was um, an interchange. And the sheer fact that they could do it, it was immediate. It, it had immediate need, but the track traffic was phenomenal. And you you probably could get to ridiculous dollar figures that they saved, but there was no other way to do it. Um, it was an immediate need in in major municipal areas. So um, here, you know, we're likely looking at difficult foundations. Um, that's where it's really helpful to have somebody who's been mucking around in that kind of thing. You could see dollar cost savings, but I think more likely you see time savings and time savings, especially in times of rampant inflation, especially related to supply disruptions and workforce nightmares, the faster you can do it, I can tell you for sure you're going to save money. But I wish I had a better answer. Representative Obermuller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Katie, what kind of language are you uh, contemplating putting in and working with the rules and regs that help uh, protect the smaller contractors of Wyoming? Mr. Chairman and Representative Oglemiro, we, we do work with YDOT very closely. We do have a highway committee, which is comprised of our contractors throughout the state of Wyoming and with YDOT construction staff, also with the resident engineers, district engineers, all the way down to, to different type of individuals, depending upon what type of topics we are. We work on YDOT specifications. Um, we do pull in those specifications from other states, from Washto, from Ashto. We look at those specifications. We sit, um, work very closely with them. So when we're developing new specifications, the specifications are what we follow when we're building the projects for YDOC. We have to meet their specifications on those projects. Those are also those specifications that we use when we're bidding YDOC projects. Those are the type of, of language that we would sit down with YDOT and work on to make sure we are comfortable with that language before it's instituted. When there is new specifications, new projects, new methods that are used um, that have come out with YDOT that is very new, we usually do um, try it on a few projects first. It's not something that we just throw out there on all projects. We would do it on a few test projects and see how it goes and then we may need to tweak it a little bit. So we make sure that both YDOT and industry is very comfortable with it. One of the, the nice things um, about Wyoming and um, our relationship with, with the DOT is that we do have that relationship, but we can also see what has worked in other states, what hasn't worked in other states, so we can pull that information so that we're not starting from scratch. And in this case, we do know states that have re recently rolled that out. We can talk to our contractors and say, what, did you, what worked well in Nebraska? What didn't what work well? What did you like? What didn't you like we can go to our partners, we can go to our members that work in Utah and say, what design projects have you guys worked on that you liked? Should we start small? Should we start big? How did you guys roll that out? How did you work with your DOT? We can pull that information in, sit down with YDOT, put that into our specification and work hand in hand with them. That's the type of language that we can be comfortable with and YDOT can be comfortable with. And then when it works, we can try it on a test project. We can start very, very small. Some of the information that we have received back from our contractor members in other states as start on a very small project. Get your members very familiar with it first before doing a larger project, just to get our members who have not experienced it before comfortable with it, and then move forward um, before doing some of the larger. So when it's for us to be comfortable to put it in the language, it's not necessarily the language in statute, it's the language within YDOT specification, within the Brown Book, within whatever um, year edition we're talking about, it's within the specifications. 
We'll follow up, Mr. Chairman. Follow up. Uh, so do you, uh, do you contemplate putting sidebars on the type of project that can be designed built? Mr. Chairman and Representative Please. Obomiro, I would, I would imagine that that would be some of the discussions that we would immediately have with them right off the bat. Um, and some of the discussions that we've had internally within our association um, in looking to see to begin with, um, we usually looking at past projects, looking at past methods that we have implemented, we have started very, very small and then ramped up. I mean, not only would this be new to some of our contractor members, this is very new to YDOT. YDOT can't just jump in on something that they've never done before. This is gonna be a learning curve for YDOT as well. So it's gonna be a learning curve on both mm -hmm. sides of the street. So I can't imagine that all of a sudden we're gonna be doing a you know, $100 million project or a $500 million project without trying some very small projects first. Thank you, a follow up. Um, uh, Mr. Madsen, can you weigh in on this in terms of the ideas around sidebars in terms of the kind of project that design build uh, would contemplate? Mr. Ratson. Mr. Chairman, Representative Overmuller, you know, um, the, the, the fun part, and you know, is the flexibility of the, the, the project. I, I, I can't necessarily envision, you know, saying certain things are completely going to be off the table in terms of why you would do it, because when you would need to do it, it might be obvious, you know, I don't have time. Um, in an emergency, I think about the Lost Bridge as, as another. So there's nothing that's obvious to me that you would sidebar and say we wouldn't do it, but you wouldn't do it unless you needed to. So the way I look at it. All right, thank you. Any further questions? Okay, I've got a couple. Ms. Ligurski, um, my question really does kind of go back to the, and I've got a couple that are gonna go down here. Um, how many of your contractors in your association are prepared um, not only for the construction portion of this but the design portion and and going into this um, we talk about we want our our wyoming contractors to do this what what type of your um your community is ready for that type of work at this point mr chairman that's a very good question um you know obviously we i'll just be honest we have the old guard versus the young guard the old guard is, you know, they don't like change, but they also know change is coming, so they're a little more hesitant. We also have the younger guard that's coming in. Um, they're very excited about construction. They're very excited about everything that they've been learning, trying new methods. Um, so it's pretty much a young guard versus um, older guard um, situation. We do have a number of contractors that do a lot of work out of state as well as in state. We do have contractors or both highway contractors and vertical contractors who perform a lot of alternative delivery methods on the vertical side of things. So we, we do have a portion of our contractors who are prepared to do this that do perform work outside of the state of Wyoming and also do work for the capital construction side within Wyoming. So we do have a portion of our membership who, who is prepared. We also have a portion that has not um, ventured into alternative delivery method that is very excited to look into it. This is something that's not going to happen tomorrow. It's something that may not happen a year from now, um, but, but we are prepared and ready to, to learn. And I'll be honest, we, we do have some people that are pretty nervous about entering down this route um, who are a little nervous, um, and they do tend to be the old guard. Thank you. Uh, so follow up on that would be um, your members. I, the, through this interim, I tried to pay attention to the discussions as much as I could. Didn't really hear a discussion on having a floor at which this would be established. You know, we could certainly establish a floor. We see that in this bill already that we have a floor in which we would authorize um, YDOT to go into something along these lines. Is your membership in a position where they say nothing underneath 100 million, um, you know, we would look at doing this, but anything up over 100 million dollars, we want to look at this. Uh, alternative contracting methods. Um, was there any discussion with your group through the interim on having a floor versus just letting YDOT have that authorization ready to roll? 
Mr. Chairman, we really haven't discussed the floor. I can tell you that we do have a, a annual meeting with, we call it our Quad State meeting. It's a meeting with the Utah, uh, Idaho, and Montana AGC chapters. We do talk a lot about um, alternative delivery methods. One of the things that has been recommended to us from those other AGC chapters and other contractor members is do not limit it by dollar amount because sometimes a $5 million project may make sense to do alternative delivery method, whereas maybe a $150 million project may not make sense to do it on. Um, alternative delivering, as Mr. Matson said, certain projects it makes sense, certain projects it doesn't, it's not necessarily the dollar amount. Maybe it's on um, a slide, maybe it's a type of terrain, maybe it's a water project. There, there is just so many ins and outs, it's not simply a dollar amount to make sense to do a delivery amount. So no, we did not put a dollar amount. And on the other hand, um, sometimes when it's trying to get contractors or maybe that old guard that's a little nervous about it, maybe they need a simple um, smaller project to, to throw their hat in to doing it down the road. So no, we did not have any discussions on that because a dollar amount sometimes does not make sense to, to limit alternative delivery projects to. Okay, thank you. And then my last question is, uh, my last question is, this does not eliminate or have any reduction in preference, correct? You guys would still retain in-state preference, um, and this also may be answered by YDOT, but my suspicion is I don't see anything about that, so I just want to make sure that we, we keep that in there. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, that is correct. Right now, um, preference, if, if preference is allowed on the project, regardless of the delivery method, preference would still be there, just like we see with, with capital construction projects within the state of Wyoming. Um, if preference is allowed, it's allowed regardless of the delivery method. Perfect. Thank you. Any further questions? All right. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate you guys so much. Look for any further public testimony. Going once, twice, and public testimony closed. Committee, um, this is a very important bill. There's a lot of implications here. And so before we move into just moving the bill, I would like to make sure that the committee understands everything that we're doing here um, and that we are all prepared. If, if questions were to come up, you would be able to back this bill up, whether or not you support it. You understand the implications. Um, and if you don't, if you have so many anchoring questions or anything like that, I'd like to make sure that we ask the director and or the contractors at this point. So um, anybody have any questions? Everybody feel 100% confident as we, if we were to move this to the floor? All right. With that being said, committee, uh, what is your pleasure? Move the bill. Moved by O'Hearn. Second. Second by Berger. All right. We will walk through this bill very quickly. We did have it ran through for us, but let's go ahead and just go page by page quickly. Uh, page one. No changes. Page two, we have this except specified under subsection C. Page three, exact same language. Page four is the main portion of this. Any amendments? Uh, I guess one question I do have is usually we look at timeframes. Director, the, the time frame that we have in this is October 1 for rules. That kind of puts a pretty tight time frame on the rules package. Um, that's nine months. You guys able to get it done in nine months? Mr. Chairman, as we talked it in the interim, we thought that was enough time. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, looks like everything else goes into effective immediately, and then the rules effective October 1st, 2023. Any amendments? Seeing none. All right, roll call, please. Representative Berger? Aye. Representative Nemec? Aye. Representative Obermuller? Aye. Aye. Representative O'Hearn? Aye. Representative Pendergraft? Aye. Representative Smith? Aye. Representative Stivar? No. Representative Wiley? Aye. Chairman Brown? Aye. That's eight eyes and one no for a due pass. Thank you so much. This one, um, I will open it up if there is any volunteers. Otherwise, I will likely manage this one and have backup from my vice chair. If anybody else wants to stand up um, and help us out, it'd be greatly appreciated, but I'll, I'll carry this one. 
All right, we do have, oh heck, we've got plenty of time. All right, we got 50 minutes to move into our next bill. And this one is House Bill 45, uh, also brought to us by YDOT. Uh, Director and Lieutenant Colonel, please introduce yourselves again for the record. Yep. The floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, for the record. Uh, Luke Reiner, Director of YDOT. Uh, with me is Lieutenant Colonel Waffler, who is uh, you know, our deputy there at the Wyoming Highway Patrol. Um, and it's our pleasure really to bring you, uh, and actually we're joined, thank you, thankfully, uh, with Mr. Swindell from uh, retirement. And, and really, uh, the, the bill in front of you today uh, is, is one that, again, was worked uh, uh, through the interim. And, and here's maybe how to think through this, is uh, we're in a period of time where we're having difficulty uh, finding troopers and finding employees across the board. And one of the questions, Mr. Chairman, that we're continuing to ask is, what else are you doing, you know, besides compensation to, uh, to help bolster uh, your numbers? And, and I'll tell you, we're working lots of things in many different areas to, to uh, main, you know, to keep a high retention rate and to assist in, in our recruiting. Um, this bill helps us on what we consider uh, the recruiting side. And so um, a little bit of background, there's, there's two um, law enforcement retirement systems in the state. One that is troopers, game and fish wardens, and DCI agents. Okay, that's, so that's in, lumped together in one retirement system. And then all the other law enforcement is in another type of is in the other retirement plan, all right? And that's the way it's been for a long time. And um, the rules are not the same. And so there's another bill floating through the Senate which addresses some of the um, basically compensation type uh, death benefits in there. And as we work through this, the interim, this, this bill actually affects this, the same statute, but there's enough difference in the topic that it is decided to split them apart. But the issue here is, is that it, right now in the trooper, warden, game fish warden, and DCI plan, you are not authorized to rehire a trooper if they retire. And as we look at the potential for bringing back a force, we say, wouldn't it be nice if a trooper's retired and they, you know, get bored at the house and want to come back and put on the uniform that we let them? And so that's really the gist of this bill. It modifies uh, the retirement plan uh, for troopers, wardens, and DCIs, uh, game and fish wardens, um, to uh, allow them to be rehired if, they, if they've retired, which is already allowed in the other law enforcement plan. So it, it mirrors the two. And we'll let Mr. Swindell talk to the retirement issues there. So that's, that's, that's what that's one of the things this bill does. And the other thing that this, this bill does is it repeals the requirement that you retire at age 65. So that is really found nowhere else in state government except for judges. And so this basically says, hey, if we're going to bring you back, um, how about we keep you for as long as you can work? And there's nothing magic that says you have to retire at age 65. So that's really the two things you see in this bill is one, the ability to rehire. Two is uh, we'll be able to keep you uh, as long as you can perform, you know, satisfactorily and not required you to retire at age 65. Um, and, and the other thing is both of those are currently allowed in the other plan, so it mirrors the plans. With that, Mr. Chairman, I wouldn't mind kicking it to Lieutenant Colonel Walther, um, and then maybe Mr. Swindell, we could stand for questions jointly at your pleasure. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. Mr. Chairman, committee, Josh Walther. A lieutenant Colonel for the Wyoming Highway Patrol. Just to add a couple things, I, um, you know, we're, we're looking, as the director mentioned, at a lot of things internally that we can improve and fix to recruit and retain folks. Um, you know, th this is one of those that is uh, really um, a benefit and an option for folks to, you can retire at 50 years old from our agency and collect. And some folks do that at 50, some folks consider that young, some folks consider that old, but a lot of people retire for different reasons. So the inability for folks to come back to work, say they put in two or three or five years in another private entity or whatever it is, they can never return to us. 
And there's definitely some folks we would love to have to return to the Wyoming Highway Patrol um, who would be a great asset to us. Granted, this is brought up and really scrutinized at a time when we're having a hard time uh, recruiting and maintaining a low vacancy percentage, but this has been discussed for years and now it's really just uh, on the forefront. So something we certainly would like to see addressed. Um, we discussed having a reserve program, which we can't even really have discussions on unless we're able to have people um, return to the Wyoming Highway Patrol in that capacity as retirees. Um, the second part of this, the age of 65, um, you know, there's certainly some folks who are 65 who probably can't do the job. There's probably some folks who are 50 who can't do the job. Um, but we certainly have some folks who are, in fact, we have a couple of folks of, of, of approaching that age as we speak. And um, boy, I'll tell you, some of them are in better shape than our 20 and 30 year olds. So we would just like to have the, the ownership of that and be able to vet folks ourselves, you know, if they're 66 and they can still do the job and do it very well. Or even if, uh, you know, folks are getting up in age, if they have a lot of leadership experience and maybe they're not hard charging our road troops anymore, but we want to maintain them in a leadership uh, perspective or leadership capacity. We want the ability to be able to decide that internally instead of having the statute uh, delineate that for us. So um, we obviously uh, support the bill. And, and with that, I would I would certainly stand for any questions. Uh, Representative O'Hearn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Vice Chair O'Hearn. Um, we've talked in the interim, how many troopers do you think this might affect? And is there a PT test on then coming back? And I know the director mentioned as long as they're physically able, um, how does that physical uh, physical thing work out? Mr. Chairman, uh, we did do a survey with a lot of our retirees representative and, and we, we got probably a handful, five to 10, who were at least expressing interest in it. I mean, it's hard to say. I don't know how many would actually commit to come back. Um, but at this point in time, one is better than none. Um, and yes, there, there is a requirement. There is a fit for duty form that they have to complete or have a doctor complete. We have a long list of things saying, hey, here, here's the job duties to become a state trooper, to be a state trooper. Can this person do that? Um, we also have what's called YPAT, Wyoming Physical Abilities Test. It's, it's, it's our physical test that we require in the Wyoming Highway Patrol for folks to be able to work for us. And that's something that you have to pass before you come back to. And, uh, and that's how we vet that. Representative Pendergraft. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this question is for the Lieutenant Colonel. Um, I'm just curious if there is a division of labor between those who are actively on the Highway Patrol, our troopers, and those who are in training. I was a soldier for many years. I've gained a lot of knowledge and experience in that and would be a good trainer, but there ain't no way I'm going to take another PT test. Lieutenant Colonel. Mr. Chairman, Representative, just I think the way I think I heard your question is for folks to come back, but maybe not work in the capacity as a trooper. Um, we don't currently have that as sworn members. Uh, we do have ports of entry and uh, dispatch um, and some civilians. And we've actually we're in the process of adding one a civilian position to safety and training. We don't currently have an avenue right now to bring back retirees just for instructing purposes or whatnot, unless it's a contract position uh, with wide out with the WHP. Um, but but on the sworn side now, we don't we don't have something set up like that. Representative Berger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this is for while in retirement. Well, let's uh, hold off. Oh, okay. We'll let retirement give their their side of things if they have okay. anything first. But hold on. All right, a second. Perfect. Any further questions for the two that have presented thus far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Lieutenant Colonel, I'm um, just out of curiosity, and I want to make sure that I understand this, you guys actually are authorized the 20 year retirement, correct? So if somebody comes in at 21, they could theoretically retire at 41. They just can't draw until 50. Is that right? Mr. Chairman, that is correct. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other questions? Wyoming retirement, do you have anything to add to the discussion? Mr. Swindell. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm David Swindell. I'm the executive director of the Wyoming retirement system. Uh, just to add just a little bit of color, I, th I think uh, it's been laid out pretty, pretty well. Uh, just remember, uh, as we discussed in the interim committee, all your retirement plans are tax advantage plans under, and they're organized by statute to conform with certain elements of the IRS code. Your defined benefit plans are under uh, uh, IRS code or a 401A qualified plan. 
And that means that money comes into the plan, uh, can come into the money pre-tax. The employee doesn't pay tax on it. We earn hopefully millions of dollars in investment earnings. We did last year. We've lost some money this year, but you know how that goes. We don't pay any income tax on that. And the only uh, taxable part is when the member actually draws their benefit on that annuity. So in order to uh, operate these plans, they do have to be in conformance with uh, elements of the federal law. And it was Congress's intent when they set all this up that uh, retirement, we would do this for, to serve the public purpose of retirement. And so these plans are designed for people that retire, not for people to uh, draw a benefit and then go right back to work within the plan. So that's the general prohibition against this, is that you cannot uh, work in the plan, in the same plan that you are drawing a benefit from. Okay. Um, technically, actually, you can go back to work as a state trooper, but you have to adopt the IRS's standard method, which means you need to stop your retirement benefit, go back to work, you can earn additional retirement service credit, and then we would re-retire you when you really retired for the second time, taking into account any money we had already paid you and so on. That's a pretty onerous uh, situation. It just doesn't happen. To meet the needs of employers that were um, needing to uh, bolster their workforce and finding someone who was qualified, the IRS allows public pension plans, if they want, to adopt certain rules that allow a person to go back to work within the plan with certain conditions. I've got Ben Brandis here, my, our general counsel in the back, who's very familiar with these things. Um, but basically, uh, there cannot be a, uh, there has to be a 30-day break in service. There cannot be any predetermined agreement. And the employer has to agree to pay a rehired retiree fee, which is equivalent to the total contribution for both the employer and the employee in the plan. Uh, given that, you can rehire a, uh, rehi we call it a rehired retiree. And that'll, that has been pretty successful. It's incorporated in the Wyoming Retirement Act and is available in all the plans that are governed by that section of the statute, and that includes the law enforcement plan. I think there are 2,700 members in the law enforcement plan. I think we had, Ben, I think it was 44 at one point, something like that. Um, 44 of those are rehired retirees. It's meeting the needs of uh, county sheriffs that just need to get a deputy, and some of these folks do it for a little while, some for a while longer, but it's been a successful option. Uh, that option has not been available in the separate code that governs the warden and patrol plan. And this bill would uh, adopt those provisions in the Wyoming Retirement Act and make them applicable to warden and patrol. And that's, that's that. And then there's the age 65 uh, discussion, which I think has been uh, pretty well uh, attributed. I would say this is the only plan other than judges uh, that has that kind of mandatory retirement rule in it. We do not have that in the law enforcement plan or the public employee plan for that matter. With that, I'll uh, certainly uh, I'll stand for any questions, actually sit for any questions. Mr. Swindell, you may have opened up the actuarial uh, debate here. We have a, a CPA that would like to ask you a question. <laughs> uh, no, pretty simple question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, on the defined benefit plan, uh, is that a percentage of their certain uh, last uh, five years of compensation, or how does that work? What kind of percentage of their compensation does that provide? Mr. Swindell. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, the standard uh, uh, retirement benefit is based upon 2.5% uh, times years of service. Uh, and the highest average salary is, uh, in the Warden Patrol Plan is the uh, average of the highest 36 consecutive months. Three years. Uh, follow, follow up. up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, what, so in English, uh, what does that mean in terms of compensa compensation? About what uh, percentage of their compensation are they drawing out of the defined benefit? Mr. Swindell? The, um, I believe the average um, years of service in the Warden Patrol Plan is about 20 years. And it, uh, it's 2.5% per year. So it's about 50% of, of final salary, or of highest average salary. All right, thank you. That would be typical. Vice Chair O'Hearn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I heard you say stop retirement benefits. So if I retire as, you know, a lieutenant colonel in the trooper program, 
and I'm paid $3,500 a month in my retirement or whatever, does that go away? And you also mentioned I pay both the employer and the employee benefit while I'm retired, re rehired on the retired program? Mr. Swindell. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, uh, let me clarify. Uh, there is the standard remedy that I described that would require a person to uh, cease their retirement benefit, go back to work, draw their wage, build additional retirement credit, and then re-retire with a slightly different benefit. But the rehired retiree provision allows the member to continue to draw their retirement benefit. So nothing changes. You would continue to get your $3,500 a month in your example, which is uh, actually pretty accurate. I think that's that's pretty average in the uh, in the plan. Good guess. Um, and, uh, it's the employer that has to pay both sides in, in the rehired retiree fee. So the, uh, uh, from the, per, uh, the member's perspective, they just go back to work, they draw their wage, uh, they're not paying into the retirement system, they continue to draw their retirement benefit, but they accrue no additional service for that. And that that's how that works. Follow up. Okay, so I think the wire retirement system that I'm in, I think they take 8.5% of my pay and then my employer matches that approximately. So we're saying the Wyoming Highway Department would pay both sides of that. So it wouldn't come out of the uh, retiree, retire, rehire uh, share at all. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, that is correct. You, you're, you have a good understanding. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Mr. Berger, or Representative Berger. Okay, Mr. Chairman, thank you. So what if this, say it's me and I'm, I'm coming back and I'm retired and let's say uh, I come back and um, with my wage, I do want to invest some of my, my, my money to put into more, maybe the 457, the deferred comp. Could, could I do that if I came back? Make sense? Let me look maybe around into that sure raw that um, well, I've got an answer to that, Ben. Okay. Can't recall. Mr. Swindell, if I can just have you repeat what you got from the audience, so that way the right. I uh, I ask uh, Ben Landis, our general counsel, for some advice on this question, and he's not certain, so we'll look it up for you and get you an answer. I am not sure that a uh, retiree um, can still contribute to the uh, 457 plan. We need to double check that. I think they can, but I'm not sure. Well, yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I guess you do understand what I'm what I'm saying, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, I just wondering if it was. Okay. Any further questions for the three gentlemen sitting before us? All right, and my pen broke, so my notes are all over the place. Um, let's see here if I had any questions. It looks like we're good there. Um, I'm good with that. So, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. You have a pin. <laughs> well, lucky there. Thank you. <laughs> we'll open this up for public comment. I do see Mr. Odekoven. Are you interested in speaking, sir? Welcome. Please introduce yourself to the committee. Mr. Chairman, Byron Odekoven, the Executive Director of the Wyoming Association of Sheriffs and Chiefs of Police rising in support of the bill. One of the, one of the aspects that was not mentioned this time, if you will, but was in the previous discussion on the other bill, is that is of officer morale and kind of the well-being of the system, if you will, uh, within the warden patrol and game and fish, the ability to look to this as an option. And for some folks, a very viable option that would be very beneficial to the morale of the overall agency to have someone with a skill set that everybody recognizes and welcome back to again offer that skill set for the betterment of everyone. So I, saying that as a point uh, to remember as we consider the bill, we again stand in support of the bill, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Byron. Any questions for Mr. Odekoven? Representative Stivar. No? Okay. He knows the question I want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Odekoven. Uh, any further public testimony? I think we've got everybody in the room that testified, so I think we're all good. So we'll, oh, do we have anybody online? No, I'm getting head shaking now. So uh, 
Closed public comment. Committee, what is your pleasure? Move the bill. Moved by Stivar, seconded by O'Hearn. Committee, let's go ahead and work this bill very quickly. Go through page one. Really not much on page one. Meat of the bill is on page two. Really the area here that we're focusing on is going to be lines eight through 12. Uh, rehiring an employee underneath this requires them to work with Wyoming Retirement Act, and that is going to be what uh, we just heard about. And then the Section 2 repealer is the 65-year-old maximum age for uh, this particular plan. Any amendments seem necessary? None. Question. Question on the bill. Diana, would you please call roll? Hey, Representative Berger. Hi. Representative Nemec? Aye. Representative Obermuller? Aye. Representative O'Hearn? Aye. Representative Pendergraf? Aye. Representative Smith? Aye. Representative Stivar? Aye. Representative Wiley? Aye. Chairman Brown? Aye. And nine ayes do pass. Thank you so much. Any uh, Anybody want to volunteer for this one? Sure, you already got one. All right. If you want two? I'll, uh, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Nemec, Representative Nemec, we'll, we'll co. There you go. We'll, we'll have you two you carry go. this. Um, gentlemen, thank Mr. you very Chairman. much. You guys did a great job moving through three bills, so thank you so much. Appreciate your attention and okay. working the bills. Cool. Mr. So, Chairman, can I make one comment? Yes, please. Uh, I want to thank you, all of you, for, for this bill. And I want to remember that. Uh, continue with our ideas of not only solving the the two-year issue of just handing out uh, certifications and then uh, these young kids or young people, employees want, want to move to other states. Let's, again, start coming up with more ideas to keep them here in Wyoming. Uh, what other benefits and whatever ideas we can do for, for these, for all staff for all public employees from teachers to YDOT to our troopers our sheriffs our local police officers let's let's come together and fix the 30 year how do we get them there for 30 40 years all right so keep bringing ideas thank you representative okay. Berger